Good evening and welcome to Waseca Public Schools School Board regular meeting. Today is Thursday, December 21st, 2023 at 6 o'clock p.m. and we are in the Central Building second floor conference room. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, in addition to our business meeting tonight is also our annual truth and taxation meeting. Um, so we have a number of presentations on the agenda for tonight. Um, so can I begin with getting in a, uh, a motion to approve tonight's agenda? I make a motion to approve today's, second. today's agenda. Uh, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Um, recognition of visitors. Uh, we don't have anyone here in person. Did we receive any emails um, today at all? Caitlin, any emails? No, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, then we'll continue with our financial audit presentation uh, by Clifton Larson Allen. I assume that they are remote or? Excellent. Yes, so uh, here to present to us tonight is Craig Popenhagen. He's a uh, partner at CLA. He is, uh, let Craig take it away. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. We can, thanks. All right, so I need to share my screen here. All right, hold on. Let me get there. There. There we go. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to talk uh, talk about the audit results here. And um, Matt, congratulations, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You made it through. So I just wanted to. I mean, in, in all honesty, thank you um, because I mean that's uh, that's a that's a tough that's a tough first audit to get through to come in. You know, after the year is done and have to go through the audit and answer for things you weren't even around for to begin with. And, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in uh, Waseca Public Schools. So it's not, I would not say it's your uh, run of the mill, run of the mill school district. There's a lot going on here. So we appreciate, uh, we appreciate your help and everything um, to get us to this point. So, um, all right. So audit results, um, clean opinion on the financial statements. Um, that's as good as you can get. Um, it basically means uh, we're comfortable with the numbers um, as presented and uh, that they're presented and measured in, uh, correctly in accordance with the county principles um, in all material respects. Um, we did, um, you've seen the finding in, in previous years on financial reporting um, that's the only finding that we have, honestly. And um, what that means is basically, um, if that's the only uh, finding you have, um, which is to say us adding about 80 pages of disclosure and verbiage to the numbers, um, for example, that Matt provides to us, um, that means you have a very clean audit. And um, it, that's one finding I would, uh, you know, I am open to, uh, um, working that one away, um, if uh, if you're so willing, and Matt is mainly if Matt is so willing, uh, but I think we could get there um, in future years. Um, let's see, statutory compliance, um, clean there. So um, the testing that we have to do uh, for Minnesota statutes, um, no exceptions or no findings there. Um, this is normal. Uh, we had a federal program audit um, for again this year, and um, with Wasika, um, you're probably always going to need need one. You just have that much um, going on, uh, and being a good sized district. So um, we tested the Esser Gear program again this year. Um, we were able to just test one program. We did not have to test multiple, uh, so that's good. Um, no findings or compliance issues to report, so clean there as well. 
Uh, we had a new accounting standard uh, to implement or um, look at this year. Um, Subscription-based information technology arrangements, which is a fancy way of saying software. Um, so anytime you have a software subscription uh, that lasts or spans for more than one year, um, you have some additional accounting uh, that you have to do uh, for that. And um, it ends up being treated very, very much like a lease. So that was new this year. Um, you did have some. So it added an asset and a liability um, for about uh, $150,000. Um, and again, it just it's like leasing a vehicle or something like that, or leasing a copy machine, um, things like that. So very similar um, treatment once we get it into the accounting records. Um, there's new things coming up in each of the next two audits. Um, so the, the fiscal 24 audit, probably not much of an impact from that one. Uh, fiscal 25, uh, primarily we'll have to just um, look at, um, I think, sick leave and potentially um, start recording um, potentially a liability for that. Uh, but more to come there. Um, we've got a couple years to kind of um, get our arms around that one. Um, shift to looking at some numbers now. So um, start off with the general fund uh, being the largest um, fund of the district, um, the main operating fund. That's where most of the uh, instruction happens. Um, maybe to say where the magic happens. Um, so we take um, we start out with fund balance, and we kind of dissect that into some different um, smaller chunks. So fund balance basically means uh, financial resources remaining at the end of the school year um, that carry forward for future use. Um, unrestricted um, is the largest component, so that's what we're starting off with. Um, it's also um, the most flexible component of fund balance. So um, management and the board, you have um, discretionary control over this uh, particular um, pool of money as far as what to spend, when to spend, if to spend, uh, for example. Um, and you've, um, again, with 2023, you had a, a budgeted spend down um, on unrestricted fund balance. Um, so uh, you had a budgeted for um, a budgeted decrease in fund balance of about 1.5 million. Um, actual decrease came in at about 250,000. So ended the year um, right um, just under $5 million at the end of 2023. So if we kind of look at that in, under the lens of the board policy of say 15% to 35% of expenditures in reserves here, um, you came in at, at 19%. So um, toward the lower end of your scale, but right in line uh, with the range um, that was specified in policy there. Um, restricted uh, fund balances. So these are um, basically um, student-related or instruction-related um, restrictions. And that uh, ended the year um, at $1.3 million. And um, this includes um, student activities, uh, fund balances for student activities um, as well. And that was kind of the, the jump, if you will, with the increase from 2019 to 2020, um, because there was a, a new accounting standard or an accounting change at that point in time um, that required, uh, for example, that student activities um, balances be pulled into the general fund. Operating capital, um, you put some of this to use. Um, close the year $365,000. And this one is a little bit more flexible. Um, it, while it is capital uh, related, a little bit more flexible because you can uh, make like curriculum purchases through uh, this area, one-to-one um, -one technology purchases, um, things like that. So it's kind of normal to see um, lease payments um, coming through here as well. Um, in addition to uh, some capital, other types of capital items. Um, Long-term facilities maintenance. This one um, ties 
right in with your 10-year um, facilities management plan. So each, um, it's you know, you take a look at that typically late summer, early fall, um, and update uh, the um, facilities plan with the Department of Education on an annual basis. And um, that's what this uh, tranche of fund balance is there uh, for, for you to use. Um, so let's uh, shift over to food service fund balance. And this one, uh, with we saw um, across all of our districts in 2022, we saw food service fund balances increase um, generally pretty substantially. And that's as a result of the um, federal programs um, in uh, 2022, where um, all meals were provided free of charge to students. Um, and the program that funded that had higher reimbursement rates for meals served. Um, as, and as a result, also being free to the students, um, a lot more participation in the meal program um, as well. So it really did add uh, to fund balance in 2022 very commonly. And um, kind of the, the challenge here, the frustrating part is, you know, this fund balance has to be used only within food service and even more specific within the kitchen. So, I mean, any things like um, healthy meals, um, healthy snacks, you know, those types of things, um, kitchen equipment uh, that can be used for that. So um, the main thing with the build um, in fund balance that uh, happened in 2022, uh, the Department of Education at the state um, basically um, kind of relaxed a little bit and said, okay, we, they saw what was going on and just said, well, come up with a plan on how, uh, how you want to use that uh, fund balance. Um, and they'll just let you um, let you use it without clawing back on it or anything like that. Um, community service. This has been a positive um, as well for Wasika. So, uh, kind of the COVID restrictions relaxing um, starting in 2022 that helped um, helped a lot. Um, so you saw um, kind of top line revenues uh, coming back in. Uh, things like that. So um, a positive for the community service programs. Um, debt service fund balance. Um, this one is just strictly related um, to making uh, your annual payments uh, on your bonds uh, outstanding. And let's see, when you see it trending downward, um, generally if you're not issuing new debt, um, at some point in time, your annual debt service kind of turns and starts decreasing um, and as a, likewise then um, your debt service fund, um, debt service levy starts to decrease with it as well. So this looks pretty normal to me. Uh, general fund revenues, kind of looking at where funding is coming from, uh, about $25.5 million top line revenues. Um, state uh, controlled sources make up about 74% of that 25 million. Um, still a healthy amount of federal dollars coming through in the form of COVID money um, in 2023. So your federal sources um, is just a little bit over 9% uh, of total revenues coming in here for the general fund. Um, looking at the expense side, um, 25.7 million of expenditures. This is just kind of illustrating um, what you're spending on. So about 73% of that is personnel, uh, pretty normal. Um, so usually that ranges typically from about 70 to 75% um, is what I'm used to seeing. Um, purchase services about 18% um, and so on. So those are the biggest components of what you're buying now we're looking at the same expenditures here and looking at where, um, where is it being spent? And kind of starting at the three o'clock position, um, you see about 8% on administration and district uh, support, which is to say uh, the superintendent office, uh, principal business office, uh, things like that. So. Um, working clockwise then, um, regular means regular classroom instruction. 
um, and then vocational, um, special education, um, instructional support, and um, pupil support. So quick math there, 16, 37, 38, 38, 60, yeah, so about a, set, a little over 75% of your uh, general fund budget um, is going to uh, classroom instruction and supporting uh, your students. Uh, kind of the trend line on uh, revenues and expenditures, um, just basically uh, budgeted spend downs uh, on fund balance is what you see happening. And then what we're looking at here is kind of the expense side and we're lifting some expenses right off of your uh, financial statements um, and simply dividing those uh, expenses by the number of students enrolled and uh, coming up with kind of uh, these uh, stats i'll have three slides here um, similar layout so the blue bars mean um, wasika so that's your five-year kind of trend line there um, the red bar is districts in the state having between 1,000 and student, 2,000 students enrolled uh, and the far right bar is all districts, the entire uh, statewide average, all districts in the state. So these are some stats, stats that um, the Department of Education publishes back. Usually it's late spring, but they accumulate all of the audit uh, results from all the districts in the state and report these back. And um, here uh, kind of uh, Looking at administration-wise, um, you're a little bit under both of the comparable state averages, um, a little under 1,200 uh, per on a per student basis going going to administration. And again, that kind of equates back to that um, eight nine percent um, slice of the pie that we saw um, a couple slides ago. So. Uh, regular instruction, this is where uh, most of the magic happens, so about $5,600 um, per student. And um, the one thing that kind of uh, is also happening uh, with all of these slides, as far as like the comparables, um, like the red bar and the gray shaded bar on the right, they're not quite as comparable today as they were before COVID um, for the simple reason that with the COVID money that came through, um, you had quite a bit of flexibility as, as to where you spent um, COVID money in your programs. Um, so as a result of that, um, some districts were heavy into, for example, in regular instruction, some were heavy into instructional support, you know, different areas within the budget. So um, because of that, the comparables aren't quite as comparable um, as they were before COVID. Um, and special education, that is about um, $3,200 per student. Um, it's kind of like your next largest um, light on in your budget. So about uh, $5.6 million, uh, whereas regular is about $9.9. So, um, with special education, um, you're a larger district, and this is a very common uh, looking slide uh, for the larger districts because you have you have the programs, um, you have the people, and as a result, you get you know you get the students. So um, that's kind of what's happening um, here. Um, to me, it looks very normal, and uh, that is the last slide that I have for you for prepared remarks. Um, so, uh, I will turn uh, I will turn the meeting back to you folks. And if you have questions, um, certainly um, we can entertain some questions. And again, uh, thank you, Matt, for making it through. Any questions for Craig? All right. Uh, thank you, Craig, for being here with us tonight. And. Uh, and for working with the district and giving us that clean clean report. Yes, thanks, Very good. All right. Well, have a good night. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Uh, the one thing I would add for the board's just information is that now before the 31st of December, 
Cliffstone Larson and Allen will official will give us the official documents to go with this. Then at the January board meeting, you'll officially approve the audit. Okay. That's how that works. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, continuing then um, with our paid 2024 Truth and Taxation presentation by Matt. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Let's get pulled up here. All right. Uh, we are here on December 21st for our Truth and Taxation. This is for taxes payable in 2024. Um, we are meeting the requirements of having our public meeting here between the two dates you can see up above. Uh, that's the reason the meeting started the half hour later is to meet that requirement as well. Um, some of the things we are required to discuss, which we have in later slides, are our budget for the current year as well as actual and revenue and expenses for the prior year. So we'll go over that as well as we'll, you know, cover our proposed tax levy and then um, one of the stipulations there is if we didn't approve the maximum in September, we couldn't increase that unless there was a vote. But however, we did, um, it, uh, excuse me, approved the maximum in September. So we did allow for some calculations, which you'll see in a couple slides as well. Just one update from the amount presented in September. And then if anyone was here, we'd allow them to comment. But uh, right now we don't have any of that. So going on to the next slide, just some more kind of the legal standards here. Um, as far as what's going on tonight, so we are allowed by law to set a levy, you know, but there's many factors that we don't control as far as the formulas and all that, that is state standard and set and we're kind of at the whim of those. Uh, we can go on again. Um, kind of just the reminder of the schedule. So on September 8th was the first time we were allowed to kind of see what the levy was shaping up to be. Um, and then we worked with the the kind of the systems that the state have to make sure that our levies set how we wanted it to be um, as much as we can control. On the 21st, we met here and we proposed the maximum. And then mid-November, there was some statements mailed out by the county to kind of show everyone they proposed um, what the taxes might be. And then on December 21st here tonight, we're having our public hearing and then if, uh, we get through the hearing, then we're going to have a motion later to approve that final amount. Um, just a reminder, there are many factors that affect property taxes as far as what everybody sees on their statements. So changes in market values of your property, changes in market values of the properties of, in every category, and as well as class rates, changes in enrollment or resident populations. Um, the state contribution versus levy contribution on many items, as we'll kind of talk about in a couple slides, but as property values increase, the state contributes less. The taxpayers have to contribute more, but overall the school district does not see an increase in revenue. Um, if there are items that were voter approved, those would obviously affect, affect property taxes and then some of these other you know adjustments we've talked about this before but we're on a three-year cycle for some of the items that are levied so the first year is based on estimate and then the next two years there's cleanups depending on actual results so we can move on again um just a reminder everyone would have got these sent out you know kind of in the spring to show you what your property valuation is doing so um there's not a lot that we can can be done right now as far as the taxes we're proposing. However, when you do get your statement here in the spring for next year, that is when you could go through the process of if you're not, not agreeing with what you're seeing, you know, contact your county, county assessor and make sure that um, you raise any concerns you have because that's, that's when these can be fixed. Um, right now we're too late in the process, like I said, for the current year. So a couple um, kind of historical items here. Um, so local optional revenue is a, a system that the state has allowed for um, school boards to access some operating dollars without having to go out for vote. Um, it started with 300, then it was increased to 724. And we do use that full authority here, um, but we do not have any additional. So we're one of 98 districts that do not have any additional operating referendum dollars right now. 
and then LTFM, which is not new, but still want to raise questions to, or uh, attention to, is this is another way that the state, or the state has allowed school districts to bring in dollars without going out for vote um, to address kind of those maintenance items that we have. So that's right now $380 per pupil. And there is some equalization there, so it's not straight levy. This is one of the ones where the state pays a certain portion of it, but uh, some of it is taxpayer funded. With that, um, Eggland gets a big benefit um, this year. This was the first year we've made it to the full 70% of the um, egg to tax credit. So um, we continue to you know, have a big benefit for our egg land there. You know, we have about 36% egg land in the, the population area or the or taxing area. So with that, we're getting about $600,000 that would have originally been paid by taxpayers covered by the state for that. So obviously that's a big benefit. Anyone who is eligible for that would see that kind of where the arrow's pointing on that, that tax or property valuation as well. So just some history and I apologize. I don't know what happened with the formatting there, but uh, obviously it got a little wonky as it transferred into Google, um, but uh, Anyways, going in kind of the historical data, you can see some of those asterisks and those are kind of the historical um, things that happened. So the first asterisk there is when the LOR, or sorry, the operating referendum um, came on. And then um, we had uh, where we started doing our OPEB. So our um, other post-employment benefits we started levying for and then also we had the building bond in 2016 there that came on that was kind of that last big increase but other than that most of the increases there are just kind of through population changes or other you know kind of as the formulas have allowed um, growth we've had that so overall if you just look at the six year kind of the last historical we're at about a 1.7 percent increase um, for this year currently we're at about 4.7 but uh, as you can see, last year we had a decrease, so you kind of take those two into account. Um, yeah. So once again, we're looking at about a 4.7% increase or $241,000 for this compared to last year. <clears throat> um, and the reason I said we it was a good thing we proposed maximum is because we did have another $29,000 of kind of shifting around as the state um, finalized numbers, especially in years where the legislation has been so active. You know, it takes a little while for the state to make sure everything's doing what it wants as far as their formulas. So um, even after our meeting, there was, I think, three or four different levies that were put out that had slightly different numbers. So um, that is why they recommend doing that maximum levy so that they have time all the way up to November 30th to kind of Get, make sure everything's working properly. So as I, as I stated, we have a $29,000 greater than what was presented in September. So, looking at the general fund, we did have an increase there of 296,000 approximately. Um, a lot of that was just um, kind of these four areas as we pointed out. So property values, um, as, as we raise in property values, we're getting less dollars from the state and more have to come from the taxpayer side. So the levy is increasing, but once again, this is not an increase in any revenue total that the, the school is seeing. It's just that shift. Oh, LTFM, just another increase there. The OPEB is just based on actual. So there we saw a decrease as we have less that are receiving those benefits. And then other increases in the operating capital and some of those other areas. And some of that was due to that kind of, we talked about that estimate. So an estimate was put in a couple of years ago and then the actuals came in and they were slightly higher than estimated. So we saw an increase there. Um, going on to the next slide, uh, community ed, we had a decrease here and that's just based on some of the estimates we're doing um, as, well, as well as some of the, you know, things we're asking for in the levy. Um, and then Craig kind of hinted at this earlier, but as our debt service is 
kind of coming off or decrease or increasing that slightly, but it's all just based on the, the debt schedule. So no surprises there. But when you boil that down, you know, the increase in the general fund and the decrease here in the community, yeah, that's where you get that 240,000. So now we're kind of getting into the actuals as we stated, we we're gonna go over. So. This is a condensed version of the audit uh, as far as all the categories of fund balance. And I know that's small, but uh, you know, each fund balance up there, um, like I said, there might be many different subsets in each one. Uh, they're restricted, especially in the general fund. There's probably about 20 different categories inside of that, but this is just covering in general. But the most important side, uh, line, I guess, is if you're talking about the health of the district is that unassigned fund balance in the general fund up there which is the fourth line down so that's that one that's just under five million um okay preparing that through and then you can see at the bottom our overall fund balance across all areas as well took a a slight increase as well this year so just kind of the actual results and then this was published in the, the paper as well as on our website, but this is a required document that we have to put out as well that kind of gives the same information in a slightly different format. So we're looking at the 2023 actual results and then the 2024 budgeted results at, at once you get over to that far right side. And it's just kind of looking at uh, restricted in the general fund versus other in the general fund. So it's not truly just unassigned, but it's, it's another way of looking at things there and then every other fund is just its own line. Um, one of the areas that's kind of nice to compare from year to year is in that bottom right hand corner is our, is our operating cost per ADM. And not every expense is considered an operating expense. So there is some, some things they removed from there, but um, that number has been pretty consistent for us around that 15,000. So as long as we don't see huge jumps in that, you know, without an explanation, that's one of those things that metrics we try to kind of keep our, keep our eye on. Another graph here, kind of similar to what we saw with the audit, but uh, where are we spending our money? Or in this case, where are we planning to spend our money? Because this is the budget for 2024. Um, overall, we have about $32.5 million budgeted across all funds but you can see 80 percent of that is in the general fund so that's obviously our main operating fund you can go on there and then inside the general fund this is breaking that down further so in our budget we have about 72 percent that's going to be that personnel cost the salary and benefits the other major category being our purchase services which you know, with the special ed especially, we have a lot of contracts where we're, you know, kind of hiring OTs and PTs and those kind of things. So that's mainly where we're spending our, our, our dollars there. Once again, the budget, but just in a different way. So instead of looking at kind of where, it's more on the program side, here's what this is called. So you can see that a lot of our spending is in that regular instruction or the instructional support areas or pupil support. Um, a little bit in sites and building with about 13% there, but most of the dollars we're, we're trying to focus towards those instruction areas. So, and then as far as money coming in, this is again, across all funds, we got about 31.8 or nine, I guess you would say million and 80% of that as well as going to the general fund. Uh, sources here, so between the state, we have about 80% of all revenue coming that way. And then the levy here is about 8.3%. And then um, the federal, you know, if you remember from Craig's presentation, we had about 9%. Well, this year with ESSER kind of going away we're down to the three and a half percent according to the budget. So that's kind of more of our normal level. Obviously we've been elevated here with ESSER and some of those COVID dollars the last couple of years. So now we're getting back into our kind of our normal operating there. 
This graph is showing our fund balance and then a percent of days. So if you take your fund balance and you look at your expenses, you know, how much of the year would we be able to continue operating if, you know, the state completely said we're done, we're not giving you another dollar. Um, so, and then as well as the percentage, so that's fund balance over expenses. So each year that it's not super comparable because the, you know, as expenses change that percent, you know, so even if your fund balance stayed exactly the same, it could still change on this graph depending on how you spent, but it's still a good way to look at things. And the red line represents the high and the low of our fund balance policy. So as long as the blue is between those two red lines, we're in compliance with our policy. And then as you can see the days there is, you know, that we don't have a policy for that, but it's, you know, just another way of looking at things. So yes, we decrease slightly for 2023 and as and if the budget holds true, it'll decrease slightly more for 2024, but we're still within our policy. And obviously as we go on, we'll want to keep an eye on that as we're looking towards 25 in the future here as well. Um, there are state refund programs. If anyone out there um, wants to look into that, you know, if they qualify, that would be up to the state, but there's certainly some resources here, so. Just want to draw attention to those. Oh, and then at the end here, so um, any questions? What was the proposed property tax levy in September? Um, at the exact dollar the amount, I'm the not percentage sure. percentage percentage would work? It was like 4.4%, I think we had presented at that time. Like I said, it was only 30,000 less approximately than what we had shown. So I guess that would be like 5,330,000 around there. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all right then. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Matt. You. All right, we'll continue then with our agenda um, with our payment of claims. And Director Dunn, you had the privilege of reviewing them this month. Um, yeah, I uh, looked through the claims for the month of November. I had a couple questions and uh, I emailed those to uh, Matt and he answered them for me. So all's good there. I'll make a motion that we got to make sure you have the right numbers here. I'll make a motion that we approve accounts payable for uh, $1,673,103.52, November dental of $7,561.59, and November payroll of $848,789.84. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And just really quick, I kind of skipped over the public comment period for the truth and taxation, but that's because we don't have anyone here to comment. So I just want to make sure, I just want people to know watching at home, I didn't let anyone not talk if they wanted to. <laughs> so, um, all right, moving on then, can I get a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the Consent agenda. Second. Uh, first and a second. Any discussion? I would just point out that our new special ed director, uh, Jeffrey Wagner, is in the consent agenda here this evening, and he looks forward to starting after the new year and uh, coming to introduce himself at a subsequent meeting. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Um, continuing then with our information items. Um, first, just to discuss our dates for our January school board meetings. Um, as of right now, the organizational meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 4th, and our regular business meeting is Thursday, January 18th. Does anyone here have any objection to the, that proposal? And then obviously at our organizational meeting, we'll set the, set the dates for the rest of our year, so. 
All right, and then continuing then with our superintendent report. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the interest of efficiency this evening, our, our superintendent report will also be our world's best workforce report for the evening. And so I welcome Dr. Brooke McGuire here this evening, our director of teaching and learning, uh, to share with us some highlights of the world's best workforce report. The DAC committee had a chance to go through this, this a few weeks ago. Uh, it's been submitted to the state as of the 15th of December, which is a requirement. And now we have the opportunity to share it with you all uh, to see where we are with our goals. So. Work. So just as a review, the purpose of the World's Best Workforce is for us to enhance student achievement and look at the teaching and learning supports that are put into place in order for that to happen. Um, and just to ensure that we have comprehensive long-term strategic plans and goals and the World's Best Workforce is to monitor and track that progress. And that's what we report to them in terms of that data. So this is the report and the data and information that was submitted. Again, a review of what the goals are. These stay the same and are identified um, by the state in terms of the categories. We set the specific goal in each of these categories, but those are kindergarten readiness, reading by third grade, reading at grade level by third grade, closing the achievement gaps, college and career readiness, and then high school graduation. And just as a reminder, we're reporting on the 22-23 school year, so this data will be in reference to last school year. So the first goal is to kind of report as we talked about at the DAC meeting. It's kind of just a report on, on where our kindergartners are at when they're coming to school. So our goal is that on the left-hand side that 90% of kindergartners will be ready for school and that's based on a variety of different academic and social skills um, measurement of those. And then on the right-hand side shows our results. So 90.1% of incoming kindergartners were deemed to be ready based on a variety of factors shown there. Just as a point of reference, our number coming in for this fall, for this current school year, was 96%. So we'll be meeting that goal um, when we uh, report for next school year. Some steps that are in place, um, we've been working on increasing communication between preschool and kindergarten and just making sure those lines are open. Kindergarten Roundup, providing additional preschool screening supports at Hartley during the fall conference time just to make sure um, that all of the students are screened. So for the most part, we're not measuring in terms of how well we're doing since not all, all of our students go to preschool here. Um, that's just a report, but we do try to ensure that every student is screened. Second goal is again, reading at grade level by third grade. Our goal is that at least 50% of third graders will score proficient by spring of 24. So this is a multi-year goal. And in the spring of 23, 43.5% of third graders scored proficient. So you can see that outlay of different proficiency percentages since 2013. Um, so from last spring, or 20, spring of 22, 39.6% were proficient. So you can see we're making progress toward that in that multi-year. Steps that we're working on. Oh, sorry, I forgot about this one. So this just shows, and I can share slides or um, answer questions, but I'll just quickly talk about some of these other charts. On the left-hand side, you see third graders in Wasika. In the middle, then, is the statewide third grader, um, third grade proficiency percentage. And then on the right is showing that line graph of from 2019 to 2023. So closing that gap in towards of getting closer to that statewide average. Literacy is definitely a huge focus um, in our district right now. In addition to implementing that Amplify curriculum in grades K through six, we're also doing a lot of training um, and getting that training set up for those um, aligned to the requirements of the state. And then there's been a big phonics focus because we've identified gaps when it comes to um, instruction and literacy. And so we're working on not only training and supporting teachers with that, but then teachers are doing a lot of work in the classrooms to help support that and fill some of those gaps. Third goal is closing achievement gaps. And so our goal is to reduce the achievement gap for students who are black and Hispanic by 10 percentage points. Again, a multi-year goal by spring of 2024. So achievement gaps were reduced by 2.9 percentage points for black students, uh, according to the math assessment reduced by 2.6 for Hispanic and math. Um, it went in the opposite direction for black and reading and then um, reduced it by 5.1 percentage points for reading um, Hispanic students. So this shows that progress from 2023, sorry, 2022 on the left side to 2023. 
So you can see the Waseca Public Schools average was 36.7% in 2022. And so that put black students at 14 percentage points behind that average and Hispanics were 18.8% .8 behind. So then when you flip over to 2023, um, that gap went from 14% percentage points to 11.1 .1 for black students and from 18.8% .8 to 16.2%. So um, closing those gaps in math. Similar concept for reading, overall percentage was 43.6% in 22. And so for black students, they were actually above our district average and Hispanic students were below by 18.6%. In 2023, then black students fell 7.7% .7 behind the district average and Hispanic students went from that 18.6% behind to 13.5%. So again, on progress, um, on track to making meeting that goal overall. Um, we're working on some culturally responsive instructional strategies of how are we really uh, being inclusive and equitable and meeting the needs of all of our students. And that also goes back to personalizing instruction and just meeting individual needs of students where they're at. Um, and continuous use of assessments, screening and progress monitoring throughout and just continuing to monitor and adjust based on the needs of our students. Fourth goal of college and career readiness. And this one is based on um, how students are identifying that they're feeling prepared. Our goal is that 80% of graduates will report they felt prepared for life after high school. According to an exit survey, our seniors take a survey in their last month of um, school, their last month of their time. <coughs> and according to that survey, 71% of the class of 2023 felt prepared. And so the next slide will show that what that looks like for those students on the survey. So it's on a rating scale from zero to five, um, five being they felt well prepared. And so combining um, those at the top of that bar graph, approximately 71% um, said that they felt prepared. Um, some different steps toward helping ensure they feel prepared for whatever they choose to do after high school, um, working on developing our career pathways so that if they know which particular area of interest they, um, they are going for, then we're helping support them to prepare them in that direction. Um, we include some of that curricular content just in terms of college and career readiness and things that they'll need to know after high school in some of the courses that we have, including Connect during Connect time. Um, and then just continuing education opportunities and information, providing them with information about financial aid, um, providing them with the opportunity to take the ACT and then offering concurrent enrollment courses, and then some other um, coursework like in AVID and teaching SEL skills and a variety of things that will help them just with things like organization and just life skills in general. And finally, fifth goal of graduation rates. Our goal is that 90% of all students will graduate within four years, and this was a single year goal, and our overall graduation rate was 74.2% graduated within four years. Again, this is the one that's one year behind. We're always reporting the previous year, so this is the 2022 graduation data. When we're looking at just the high school, yes. 89.2% um, is the graduation rate for just the high school. So very close to our goal if we're looking at the high school only. ALC was at 15.2%, but again, we talked about how um, some of our ALC students, it's more realistic for them to be on a five or six or seven year graduation plan. So 42.4% of those percent of those students are continuing. So we continue to see that percentage fluctuate a bit. You can see that breakdown from the overall district on the left-hand side. And that again at the bottom shows how many graduated, continuing, dropped out, and unknown. In the middle is just the high school, and on the right is just the ALC. So we report as an overall district, but it's comprised of senior high data and the ALC. And the, that just shows the line graph again, um, state in comparison to our district, in comparison to just the senior high in the middle, and the ALC is that bottom 
like blue line on the right. We're continuing to work to ensure that all of our students have a four year plan. So whether they stick to it exactly or not, but they have a plan in place um, that if they do stick to that, they will meet the graduation requirements and be on track for graduation. And then that helps the counselors monitor and help provide support um, based on if they're off track from that plan. So they're continuously meeting with students, um, our counselors are. And then we also have the ALC as an option too, um, just whichever setting is the best um, place and best meets the needs of that particular student. A lot of data informed decision making and the use of assessments I mentioned earlier, just to make sure um, students are staying on track and then we're providing supports as needed if necessary. Again, back to personalizing instruction because every student is different and just meeting their needs where they're at. And then that professional development is getting at that as well, ensuring that we're inclusive and equitable for every student. So this is just an overall view of each of those goals and where we're at. Met for kindergarten readiness, we're on track for those next two. Um, didn't meet that college and career readiness goal, um, but have had already started some good conversations about how we're monitoring that and true preparedness and looking at that post-graduation if they still feel that way. Um, and then graduation not on track, primarily just for that combination of high school and ALC, but continuing to monitor both of those as well. Any questions or anything else to add? I think the only thing I would add was that the career and college and career readiness survey, we're doing some work with breaking that apart to see what some of their responses are. You know, for example, I think if I pick up the, if I'm thinking of the right example, it was 90% of the students said that their high school experience had high expectations and high rigor. So if most of the kids felt like it was highly rigorous, but less than that felt they were prepared. What's the disconnect in an 18 year old brain there as we're working through that. So um, as Brooks leading it through with the counselors, we'll be having some more discussion around, do we collect that differently? Do we collect it in a more clear way? Um, so we, cause the result is important. We can respond to that, but it's more importantly that we actually know what, they, what they're thinking. We're accurately representing their thoughts. Um, cause if it's not accurate, then we need to change our measure. Um, and if, it's, if it is accurate, then we need to change what we're doing to prepare them, right? So I have to figure that part out first. So thank you for your work on that, Brooke. At what point are seniors made aware of that, that there's gonna be an exit survey? Like when do they, is it when they're given the survey or do they know that this is coming? Um, they likely don't. It's typically given by Mr. Hansen in the social studies class, just, just because that's when we can get most of the seniors. And um, I'd have to check with him to know if he gives them a heads up on that, but I'm, I would guess they probably find out in that moment. I'm just curious how, how well they under, if, if, are the question are they do they understand the questions and what the point of it is kind of sure yeah right so. Um, other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Brooke, for being here. And anything else to add, Eric, as far as superintendent report? Not this evening, no. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, back to you, Matt. <laughs> sure. Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not tired of me yet. Um, there's not a lot to uh, go over with my report this evening. However, I did um, update graphs as we kind of are accustomed to seeing here for the end of November. So nothing really standing out there. Um, you know, we're a slightly um, more spent on our budget as far as percentage than we were last year comparing the general fund was at 29% now we're at 31% but I think when looking at that part of it is staffing obviously there's just natural increases in staff and then as well kind of going with what Brooke was presenting I think we accelerated some of our curriculum purchases to get some of that going so that that kind of stands the reason if you look at the uh, monthly expenditure comparison you can see the supply um, areas up substantially we were at 32 percent spent last year and we're at 46 percent so i think that goes back to that amplify that was a a big dollar item but uh obviously well worth it and then as far as enrollment goes um we just had a slight decline <coughs> from the last time we discussed that as well but i think it's following our natural trend of kind of losing a couple students as we go on throughout the year so 
unless anyone has any questions on those, I, that's all I have for this evening. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, moving on then to committee and board member reports. Dita, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. We, I have a couple of committees. We have superintendent evaluation committee and we discuss or we review our superintendent goals. He is on track on everything and we will have detailed summary presented in January. Then we had a facility committee that I will leave other people to talk about. <laughs> and policy committee, I will just also let other people talk about. Okay. Give you a chance to talk. <laughs> Thank you. Dave. Um, had a personnel committee re um, meeting, uh, DAC committee meeting, finance committee meeting, and today we had facilities. Um, I did watch the uh, advocacy, advocacy kickoff for uh, Minnesota Rural Education Association. Uh, I did watch that as it was uh, going on here a few days ago. Um, they talked about their legislative platform and state budget projections and also they had uh, some of the people that were running for offices there um, could take a turn and speak uh, about themselves, uh, one of which is Craig Brendan, who is a t our band teacher out at WIS. Uh, he's running for re-election, and we can, uh, we can all uh, cast a vote, um, hopefully for him, um, um, here in the next few days. Uh, I did watch the MSBA organizational webinar today. Um, I haven't watched that for a while. Uh, it, I always find it interesting, no matter how many times you go through some of these things, you always learn some new things. Um, so that was good too. So, your turn. Um, I had similar committees, personnel, DAC, and finance, and a lot of the stuff is stuff we've covered tonight, so I have anything to add. Okay. Colin. Um, so, Earlier this week, we had our choir concert, and so that was really good. And then um, our peer study group, um, we have an interventional group that started recently. Mm -hmm. So that's where like underclassmen can go and get help from the MHS students. And so that has been going really well. I've been there a few times. And so it's nice to see that area now. And then our food drive ended this week, and that got a ton of support. Um, and I know that at the one of the girls' basketball games alone, um, there was $155 collected to support that. So that's, it's been going really well. And then uh, we've had some exciting sports games going on. I know I've been to a few of them for a pep band, so that's been really fun. And then we have our talent show coming up in early January. Um, and then our upcoming BPA competition for Business Professionals of America. That's also like, I think the first or second week that we're back in school. And then um, the chili feed uh, from the band boosters, it's tomorrow night, uh, along with the alumni pet band. So that'll be a fun game. Okay. Wow, it's busy at the high school. Yeah. <laughs> and the chili feed will not be like we snowed out this year, so that's oh. a good thing. I think last year there was two <laughs> dates or something yeah. we had to try to get to. <laughs> Important. Do you have a comment or? Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, you guys are definitely busy, so thank you for that comment. Uh, Charlie. We had an arena meeting a couple of weeks ago. Ice is in, hockey program started off. Things going good. Their dehumidifiers got, got repaired. Uh, Zamboni's going, so they found enough drivers, so arena's going good. Uh, negotiations, we've had um, mass agreements with the food service paraprofessionals and custodials, so we got agreements on three of them. Still got some more to go yet, uh, but uh, but you know, there seem to have been one along good with Eric and Matt's guidance in this whole thing, and also they've been doing a good job there. So um, I think that's it for the ones I've been to. So. Okay. There. Uh, I was at Insurance and Safety. Uh, we kind of just covered over some district injuries, uh, pretty simple stuff, uh, and some needs throughout the buildings uh, for safety-wise. Nothing, nothing too extravagant there. I think the couple of things that were brought up were put to bed right away. So 
um, DAC. I sat through that, kind of seen the same thing that was presented tonight. Uh, policy, we went through a few. I think we're past uh, the ones and came back on track. As of right now. So yeah, for now. <laughs> and uh, facility, facilities, I sat, I sat in that tonight. Um, you know, we covered some, some of the needs that, that are felt that, that our buildings need and we need to move forward on prioritizing and understanding timelines on them and and getting a good accurate uh, uh, plan together for for our community to, to move forward on that um, but need to make sure that we do the homework and, and get it put together proper so all right thank you um, I was on this month I had personnel negotiations superintendent evaluation which have all been discussed and then um, I did have the professional growth and development um, and they reviewed the CRIS which is the culturally responsive instructional strategies I think that, and Brooke had mentioned that um, as one of the um, means for closing that um, that gap and so in, at the November professional development, um, they had conversations about CRIS and they discussed how that those conversations will continue in January and uh, very positively received by all of our staff. That seemed to be good conversations and good use of professional development. Um, she mentioned that the summer MEP Institute, which I forget what MEP stands for. So the Minnesota Education Partnership. It's our, it's our partnership with Minnesota State. Okay, and it's been in Wasika for a number of years, but this year it's going to go to Watana, so it should be kind of exciting to go see the new the new building out there. But that'll be in June, um, and then she talked about uh, the Read Act requirements and what our plan of action is will be would, will be shared if not already shared with the buildings um, pretty soon here. So um, that's all I had. So. All right, uh, moving on then to recognitions and positive board feedback. Adi, do you want to start us off again? I didn't have a chance to go to see many events. I just know that I'm ready for a break, <laughs> and I would like to wish everybody Merry Christmas and Happy, Happy New Year. So, yes, Dave. A um, couple things. One is I know at Hartley they started a new kind of a reward recognition program called Brilliant Blue Jays. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, I know it just got going here a while ago, so I thought that was a good thing. And I would like to uh, thank Matt and his staff for um, all the work that they have done and what they have to keep track of and take care of, and um, especially when um, our long-term business manager left us and we got a new one, and he seems to have hit the ground running, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was only going to point out, I think uh, the choir has been at a number of different events. He had a concert, but then there was also a thing at the mill. There was a Lions Club. There was uh, various things. So it's nice to see the choir and at, I guess our activities in general getting out and getting, bringing positivity to the rest of the community. So thanks. Yeah. Colin. Um, just again, mentioning our newer interventional group. Um, our counselors, Ms. Lawrence and Ms. Sandbeck, work really hard on that. And I think it's a really great new opportunity for other people to like have a space where they can ask questions and get that help that they needed outside of regular school time. Yes, I agree. Charlie. Choir, the choir um, concert last um, Monday night was, was great. They did, kids did a nice job, a nice improvement from First, the first concert, really nice improvement. Everybody was, was happy. They were fun, fun being up there. I've been to uh, several girls and, and boys basketball games, and the, the boys are doing well. The girls are struggling a little bit, but they'll get better. It'll happen, and and uh, so it's good to see good participation in that uh, and the levels. So um, I think that's what I'm about it about it for me. All right. There. Um, I visited or wa uh, watched the fifth and sixth grade band concert the other night. That was very pleasant to listen to. Um, that just been kicked off wrestling season. Our youth wrestling is over invited to Waterville wrestling with those guys tonight. So. All right. Um, I mentioned this before our meeting started, but I just wanted to thank um, both of our local newspapers for their um, really 
um, extensive and, but also positive coverage of our district. I really enjoy um, reading what their summaries are from our meetings, but also how they cover other events in the district, including our sports programs, but, um, but a lot of things that are going on. And, and both papers are really doing a great job um, giving us that coverage. Um, and I also wanted to highlight um, a blood drive that's being organized by um, our ju a junior student at the high school, Mason Wad, and his family. Um, there's a blood drive December 29th at Farm America, um, and there's a recent article in both papers about that, but I encourage everyone to consider donating to that cause and supporting one of our students. So, and that's all that I had. So, all right, are we ready to move on to action items? Davis. <laughs> All right, can I get a motion for item A? I, I make a motion to approve acceptance of receipt gifts and donation in, uh, for $268.50. And thank you for Alina Health and St. Paul Lutheran Church for the donation. Second. <laughs> we have a first and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? And remind it's a roll call. So, Caitlin, if you would call the roll. Grant Sheffer? Yes. Dave Dunn? Yes. Adina Mansfield? Yes. Theron Cooker? Yes. Charlie Freed? Yes. Julie Anderson? Yes. Okay. Motion carries unanimous. Um, can I get a motion for item B? A motion to approve January organizational meeting dates. Second. First and a second. Um, and just a reminder that was January 4th for our organizational meeting and January 18th for our regular business meeting. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion, motion for item C? I'll make a motion we approve the final levy pay for 2024, uh, the details as presented by Matt earlier. Do we have to say that any differently? No, I think you're good. I have a, a first, can I get a second? Second. First and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Just so there's not confusion, I do see in that short summary, C is saying 2023, but if you look at the action items on page or further down the agenda, it does correctly say 2024. Yeah, so, so it's, yeah, the final pay levy 2024. And your motion was accurate. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item D? I'll make a motion we approve the world's best workforce report for 2022-2023. Second. First and a second, any discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item E? And is there a resolution we need to read? There is. So if anyone would like to make that motion, Caitlin has a resolution for you. Raise your hand if you would like it. <laughs> oh, I, Grant will do it. <laughs> do I have to read the whole thing? Yes. Oof. Yeah. Okay. I, make, I would like to make a resolution for establishing the combined polling places for multiple precincts, designating hours during which the polling places will remain open for voting for school district elect elections not held on the day of a statewide election. Be it resolved by the school board, independent of school, school board of Independent School District 829, pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 205A.11, the precincts and polling places for school district elections are those precincts or parts of precincts located within the boundaries of the school district, which have been established by the cities or towns located in whole or in part within the school district. The board hereby confirms those precincts and polling places so established by these municipalities. Pursuant to Minnesota Statutes, sections 205A.11, 
The board may establish a combined polling place for several precincts for school elections not held on the day of a statewide election. Each combined polling place must be a polling place that has been designated by a county or municipality. The following combined polling places are established to serve the precinct specified for all school district special and general elections not held on the same day of a statewide election. Uh, combined polling place of Christ Community Church. Uh, this combined place serves all territories on independent school district 29 in precinct 1A, City of Wasika, precinct 1B, City of Wasika. Uh, combined polling place of United Faith United Methodist Church. This polling place serves all territories of Independent School District 829, located in Precinct 2A, City of Wasika, and Precinct 2B, City of Wasika, actually, and the County of Minnesota, I think. Uh, the third one is the Wasika County Highway Department. Uh, combines place serves all territory in Independent School District 829, located in Precinct 3A, City of Wasika, 3B, City of Wasika, and Wasika County, Minnesota. That's it. Oh, well, <laughs> I told me it was back. Uh, combined polling place of St. John's Church. Uh, this serves all territory of Independent School District 829, located in Blooming Grove Township, Iosco Township, Otisco Township, St. Mary's Township, Wilton Township, Woodville Township, Wasika County, uh, Morristown Township in Rice County, and Lamont Township in Steele County. Pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 205A09, the polling places will remain open for voting for school district elections not held on the same day as a statewide election between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. The clerk is directed to file a certified copy of the of this resolution with the county auditors county auditors of each of the counties in which the school district is located in whole or in part within 30 days after its adoption. As required by Minnesota Statutes 204B16 subsection 1A, the clerk is hereby authorized to direct and directed to give written notice of new polling place locations to each affected household with at least one registered voter, voter in the school district whose school district polling place location has been changed. The notice must be a non-forwardable -forwarded, notice mailed at least 25 days before the state of the first election to which it will apply. A notice that is returned as undeliverable must be forwarded immediately to the appropriate county auditor who shall change the registration status to challenged. If a combined polling place is challenged, the change must be adopted at least 90 days prior to the first election where it will be used unless the polling place has become unavailable for first use. That's us. All right, we have a motion. <laughs> second. <laughs> we have a second uh, from Adida. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? <laughs> Just a reminder, this is an annual resolution. Yeah. In the event we were to do an election outside of the cycle, we have those things predetermined. It doesn't lock us into anything. It's just something we do before the first of every year. Particularly right. since there's a 90-day requirement in order to do that, so. Well, yeah. if one of those places closed down, it gives you the opportunity to change them. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Are they, uh, is that Central Daylight Time, Central Standard Time, or what? <laughs> it, it wasn't specified. It doesn't say, does it? Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote, and this is a roll call. Um, Caitlin, if you could call the roll. Grant Shepard? Yes. Dave Dunn? Yes. Adina Mansfield? Yes. Aaron Kirkman? Yes. Charlie Priest? Yes. Julie Anderson? Yes. Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item F? I make a motion to approve purchase of services agreement for transportation between Minnesota Prairie County Alliance and ISD 829. Second. First and a second, any discussion? Is this a pro, uh, service that we've had? Yeah, it's a new location, so we had to add that transportation to that place, but they're servicing from a different location. Yeah. Yep. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item G? Yeah, I, mo I move we approve the 2023 to 2025 a master agreement with our food service. 
Second. Harrison, a second. Any discussion? One thing I would just add is I want to take the time to thank all of our, our groups for coming and talking with us at the table. I feel really positive about the resolutions we came to to improve contracts, but also stay within our fiscal responsibility goals. And so special thanks to the negotiation team of board members, but also the negotiation teams for all of our staff who got it done so far. I won't repeat this for all three master agreements on the agenda tonight, but just thank you to all the teams for the work. I think we, we got to some really, um, really positive places. Agree. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item H? Motion to approve 2023-25 master agreement with paraprofessionals. <laughs> second. We have a first and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item I? I'll make a motion. We approve the 2023-2025 master agreement with custodial service. Second. We have a first and a second. Any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> motion carries unanimous. Can I get a motion for item J? Motion to approve revised policies. Second. Uh, we have a first and a second. Um, and those are, these are the final, second and final reading of policies 515, 616, 617, 620, 621, and 624. Um, any discussion? Colin, did you get your, did it answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. He had emailed me a question about one of them, so thank you for doing that. Yes. yes. No, he caught me after the choir concert and asked, asked me the same question, but I appreciate that you read these so thoroughly and, and ask questions. That was fantastic. Uh, but thank you also to the policy committee and all your work on getting these done. So uh, any further discussion? All right, hearing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And then finally, item K will acknowledge the first reading of revised policies. These are policies 708, 709, and 806. All right, um, on the agenda we have um, moved to a closed session to discuss negotiations. We don't have a need to go into closed session today, so we can just ignore um, items 11 and 12. Um, upcoming items and reminders, uh, winter break is um, December 25th until January 2nd. Um, the district specifically is closed um, December 24th to 25th and January 1st to the 2nd. So. Any other reminders? We made it to Christmas break without a snow day, so yeah. kudos that to you, Mr. Husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just, and just Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everyone as we head into a, a a time of relaxation and rest and hopefully family and friends get to spend a lot of time with. Yes. So. All right, if there's no further discussion, can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion we adjourn. Second. <laughs> we have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.